This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. And on today's program, we're going to continue to look at 2018. It's something that I consider of extreme importance because as we move into this new year, 2018, we have to make decisions in advance. We have to understand what's going on, and we can't make decisions regarding our own personal lives or decisions regarding uh, what our responsibility is in shaping the future and shaping the direction of America. You see, without education, without knowledge, without wisdom, or as the Bible says, without vision, the people perish. And the reality is that the vast majority of people who call themselves Christians and people who are non-Christians don't have a vision um, for their lives and for their world. And most importantly, they don't have a vision from God for their lives and for their world. And therefore, if you're talking about your personal life, your family's life, your children's life, and the life of your friends, if you do not, and I hope you're Uh, paying attention very carefully. If you do not have vision from the Lord, you will perish. And that's not the Lord's plan for your life. He doesn't want you to perish or your loved ones to perish. He wants to bless you and prosper you and use you. And then when it comes to the destiny of America... Again, we have to, you know, grab and own this truth from the Word, which says, without vision, the people perish. This is so critical. I can't, I can't, you know, if I try to uh, strengthen or underscore the importance of those words, it could potentially backfire as being, you know, uh, emotionalistic or whatever. And I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to effectively communicate. But these two areas that we deal with, our own personal lives and environment and the nation and the world, again, without vision, the people perish. Now, that is a principle that works in your life and my life and the life of our kids and our grandkids and our friends and so on and so forth. It works in relationship to your career, your business, your job, your family, your marriage, your uh, singleness, um, wherever you are in life. Without vision, the people perish. And then if we open our eyes, and most of you who listen to this program do open your eyes or you wouldn't be listening to the program, um, Without vision, the people perish is essential for you and me as members of the supernatural body of Christ because we have a job to do from Jesus Christ. And that, all of that information determines what is going to happen in 2018 and beyond. Now, there are some things, you know, where God is sovereign and God may overrule us because he's God. And so that doesn't concern me. And the reason it doesn't concern me is that that's not really my business. In the same way, if I share my faith in Christ with somebody and I feel the Lord's directing me to share my faith in Christ, you know, on a personal level. I'm not talking about like in this ministry or on the air or on television or social media or whatever. When the Lord leads me to 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 share um, uh, how I became born again or minister to somebody or leads me to lead them into accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior, I don't need to know a whole, you know, I don't have to worry about the outcome. I'm never fearful, and neither should you be. I'm never fearful about whether or not that person may reject Jesus 
and not be willing to accept Christ. Because that's not my responsibility. That God, that's God's responsibility. You see, the results are up to God. My job is to be faithful. And so when the Lord, we know, first of all, from his word, that he generally, not generally, we know from his word that Lord, the Lord wants all of his people to share their faith and win people to Jesus Christ. We know that from the word. But then when it comes to moment-by-moment -moment situations in life, sometimes the Lord will, will quicken us with his Holy Spirit and impress upon our hearts to strike up a conversation uh, with the intent of ministering to that person and then uh, giving them an opportunity to accept Christ. And really that's the most effective form of personal evangelism because you're being led by the Holy Spirit. You know, most of the time when the Lord uh, impresses that on my heart, <clears throat> what happens is um, the Lord, you know, I feel, I feel the Lord speaking to me, not in an audible voice, but in impressions. I feel the Lord saying to me, non-audibly, I want you to walk over to that particular person that you just talked to a minute ago, and I want you to, to just, just talk to them. And I know what the Lord means by that. He, he, he's saying to me, just, you know, step out of faith, develop a, like a, a relationship with them, you know, a, a small relationship, an interaction. And then the Lord, because this comes from experience, then the Lord I know is uh, requiring of me to pay attention to what that person says. And as I develop this relationship, I see if the door is open for me to minister to them and what God might have me share to them. And, uh, and usually from there, if they're not saved, then the Lord will uh, prompt me to actually invite them to accept Christ in their Lord, as their Lord and Savior. And I'll give you an example of this, because this ties into the entire program. I was uh, in uh, Missouri... I don't know, four weeks ago, approximately, uh, with my co-author, Troy Anderson. Um, and we wrote uh, Trumpocalypse together. And we also wrote the Babylon Code together. So we were in Missouri uh, to join Tom Horn's network, Skywatch, and do a week, a week's worth of interviews on Tom Horn's Skywatch TV, um, with Derek Gilbert being the host. Many of you know Derek. He has his own From the Bunker uh, uh, blog site podcasting, and he's a, he's a really brilliant man, and his wife is a brilliant woman. And I've gotten to know him more and more over the years at these prophecy conferences, and I can't tell you how impressed I am with this guy. Because he's brilliant, and, and, and it's, it's captivating for me to listen to him. So anyway, uh, we're in Missouri, staying at the hotel for that evening, because we fly in a day early when you do TV, because you usually burn out. So we arrived late, which is normal, <laughs> you know. And the problem is you don't ever know where you're going. And... Uh, I wasn't hungry, you know, going to the airport and stuff, so I forgot to buy food. And I figured there'd be something within walking distance of the hotel to get food, but there wasn't. And I was kind of hungry, but, you know, it wasn't a huge thing because I was going to go to bed anyway. And this guy who's staying at this hotel with this family um, overhears me. And then he comes up to me and says, you know, hey, I heard that you're hungry. He said... You know, I'll, I, I'd be glad to share with you some pizza and soft drinks and stuff that uh, my family just ordered. The pizza place is going to deliver it any minute. Now, the sad thing is I'm from New York and, and L.A. So, you know, what happens when you spend time in New York City and L.A.? You get cynical about people, which is wrong, but you just do. Because in places like New York City, everybody's got to angle, everybody's got to hustle. So your guard is always up. So when you get genuinely approached by a sincere person, you're you're kind of keeping them at a distance because you don't you're not you don't uh, 
based on your experiences in New York City, you know, you have your guard up. But this guy was the genuine guy. You know, I mean, he was for real. And so I asked the lady that was checking us in, I said, uh, you know, I just asked about him briefly. And she said, oh, yeah, he's a really wonderful guy. He's been staying here with his family. And I don't want to give away his job. You'd be surprised at his job. You really would be. <laughs> because you wouldn't think in the field that he's in that um, he would be so friendly. And I had no idea that he was a Christian, by the way, because I kind of I kind of put out the feelers on that by saying that, uh, you know, I'm. A, he says, well, what are you in town for? And I said, well, I'm a Christian author and a Christian minister, and uh, we're doing a Christian TV program here. But he didn't pick up on it, so I, I thought he probably wasn't a Christian. In any case, even though I declined the offer for food, I got to my room, and my plan was this. And, and, and don't think this is strange. This is like happens to me all the time. You just got to survive wherever you are. Because it was late. Everything was closed in the hotel. So my plan was uh, to go to the snack machine. And I'm talking about this snack machine was rather meager. And get myself a couple of Pop-Tarts. Now, and I'd microwave them and that would be my dinner. I, because when I got to the room, I realized I was hungry. Now, I haven't eaten Pop-Tarts in years, but Pop-Tarts heated up in a microwave sounded really delicious after starving to death. You know, not literally. And then I would indulge myself in two of these Hostess cupcake, uh, chocolate cupcakes, you know, with the white swirl. <laughs> so I was all prepared. Actually, I came back down to the lobby got change from the, the person who checks you in to, to use the machine. And he walked, this guy walks up to me with this big smile on his face and he gives it me, so I couldn't refuse it, he gives me this uh, white, uh, you know, uh, cardboard plate, you know, like you have at picnics, and had two slices of pizza and a soft drink in a can. And I, I said, thank you very much. And I was really, really, you know, I was just... Uh, uh, caught off guard with his sincerity, and I really, really thanked him because I was just like, you know, it turned out I was hungry, and I was really appreciative. So I went up to my room, and I microwaved the pizza, and the pizza was, was so delicious because I was so hungry. And I went to bed, and that was great, you know. So uh, I talked to him in the lobby a couple of times as we were going in and out uh, from time to time uh, because we were shooting these interviews on Trumpocalypse with uh, Skywatch and Tom Horn. Derek Gilbert was the host, and we were doing some programs for Derek Gilbert's program. And meeting the Skywatch TV team again. We've been up there a couple of times, and they're all great people. And the location of these studios is in a beautiful... When I say beautiful, I'm not talking about suburban. I'm talking about farmland. And... Uh, uh, Tom's uh, son is terrific. Uh, the, the, the wives of the sons, his daughter, his wife, I mean, they're just really like a team and a family. And we met a number of Christian authors there and Christian filmer, filmmakers there. So we had a, a great time. So we got back and we had to get up really early in the morning. And you know, I'm not a big talker really in the early in the morning unless I've had mega doses of, I like my coffee. Every cup of coffee has to be, you know, a full cup of coffee. But if every cup of coffee is not as strong as espresso, it's, it's, it doesn't do, do anything for me. I was shopping in Trader Joe's, uh, you know, the, the, I guess you have it where you live. And I said, I want to, because it was the holidays, it was New Year's, I said, I really want to strong, rich, bold cup of coffee. You know, and I would grind the beans and whatever. So you, you can't talk to a non-coffee addict or non-coffee drinker and communicate about coffee because they just don't get it. It's got to be a fellow caffeine addict. So I, uh, I said, well, who drinks coffee here? And so the store manager uh, turned me over to this woman who was also a fellow, you know, hardcore coffee drinker. And I said to her, she said, what kind of coffee do you want? And, you know, I just was really blunt. 
And you may not like that, but you know, that's how you relate to people. You talk to people in the language that they weren't phased. They, 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 it helped me bond with them. I said, I like a kind of, uh, I, uh, when I have a cup of coffee in the morning, I want that coffee to wake me up and kick me in the, I used a particular word, three letters. Let's just, so I'll tame it down. I, I want whatever coffee you recommend to me, that coffee's got to wake me up and kick me in the butt. She laughed and I laughed, but that's the kind of coffee I wanted. So anyway, back to the to the, to the story with the guy. It's really early in the morning. I had some coffee, but it was weak. And then I had some stronger coffee. And I got up really early in the lobby because I didn't want to miss the flight. And the Lord said, I want you to speak to him. I want you to spend time with him. So I sat at his table. He had his kids there. And we talked. And for some strange reason, we talked. The Lord gave us 30 minutes to talk. And he opened up his life to me, and I was able to minister to him in key areas of his life, strengthen him, encourage him that God gave him unique talents and abilities and gifts that he wanted to use. And I said, I said to him what talents, gifts, and abilities that I'd already noticed in him. And it turned out he was a, a, a veteran. I mean, he was a young guy, but he was a veteran of one of the recent wars. And he had, you know, had to go through PSD, D, you know, through the trauma of the war and God was rebuilding. But I was able to really encourage him and lift him up in ministry and on a personal level. And uh, I thank God for that opportunity. So we talked about where our nation is going. And um, he was fascinated about the book Trumpocalypse. So. As I, as I run this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries, Paradise Mountain Church, we minister, you know, like officially, I guess you can say, on television, on radio, on the Paul McGuire Report, on social media, on film and video. Uh, the, the Roku channel is now ramping up with professional broadcast quality messages. And you need to go to paulmcguire.us and get... Uh, the address for the, I mean, address the link for the Roku channel so you can watch it. And we got lots of videos and YouTubes up there. So the point is, as we orient our lives, I shared that with you, just to open up a kind of personal part of my life. But to, to, to say that, you know, I never find witnessing and ministering to people a burden or a legalistic obligation or I never do it because I, I feel manipulated. That's not how it works. People try to do that to me when I was a young Christian, you know, manipulate me through guilt to share my testimony. And it doesn't work. I find that if the Lord anoints me, the Lord will give me a supernatural prompting. Now, I have to step out on faith to share my faith, but it's not like weird, you know. It's, I don't have to do it on my own strength, and it's joyous. And you're talking to a guy that, that normally would not particularly like doing that. But it's a joy because God anoints you. In the same way, God anoints you for those things and other things in your life. So when you're looking at 2018, not only are we going to analyze data that's out there, such as predictive programming, such as analyzing current events, what's happening in the media, what's happening in economics, what's happening in politics, what's happening in terms of the church, what's happening in terms of spiritual warfare for our nation. But we have to understand that, and this is a critical point I want to drive home, the same principles that involve gaining God's supernatural wisdom supernatural guidance and supernatural victory, those same exact principles work in your personal private life, whether you're ministering to a person, whether you're being a mom or a dad or a grandparent or whatever, or an employee, those same principles work in your personal life, your job, your career, your education, whatever. Those same principles work there. But the same exact principles work in the, let's call them the bigger picture areas of ministry. 
So when I share with you or I teach from the word certain principles, um, I try to always incorporate the the principles involved in spiritual warfare uh, regarding the destiny of America, how we're involved in the uh, greatest season of spiritual warfare, perhaps in the history of the world over any nation, because what happens in America is going to affect the entire world. But the same principles for spiritual victory, for victory and in intercessory prayer, for wisdom, for vision, are those same principles are, and this is the word I used to that guy that I met in Missouri, because I, he was telling me about it, what, what he did in the military. And I said, those talents and gifts are what we call transferable concepts. That's something I learned from Dr. Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, who would say, you know, you have this knowledge base, you have these talents and gifting and training, and then he would point out that these are transferable, transferable truths, transferable concepts that will work in the personal world or in another kind of job. And that's what I'm trying to stress with you right now, is that in order to have victory for the body of Christ, for your children and grandchildren, and for your own and your own personal life, private life, and then have victory turning the tide of the spiritual battle in America, the first among many spiritual principles that we have to grab hold of is uh, that without vision, the people perish. So we must have a vision from the Lord, not a vision from a man or uh, something else, but a vision from the Lord. Why? Because when we have a vision from the Lord, we have a goal from from the Lord. You know, it'd be like if you if you got in your car, GPS or no GPS, and every day you didn't know where you were going or where you were supposed to go. No matter how many hours you would drive, you would never end up where you were supposed to be, because you did you had no idea where you were going. You had no vision. Like, am I going to work? Am I going to go grocery shopping? Uh, or whatever. Am I going to school? I mean, that's very simplistic, but but if you enter your car and you don't know where you're going, you're not going to arrive where you're supposed to be because you need a vision of where you're going. That's simplistic. I understand that. But that also works for the body of Christ when it comes for this titanic spiritual battle for the destiny of America, and it also works in your private and personal life. You can't achieve your goals by God's power. You can't become the person that God wants you to be. You can't utilize your talents and giftings and abilities. You can't prosper. You can't be victorious if you don't have an idea of where you're supposed to be traveling to. Because in order to get to a particular destination, you have to know what resources you need, uh, what what uh, route you would take, how long it's going to get there, and other things. So you must have a vision for your life, and you must have a vision for your children's life. And then, when you have a vision, you won't perish. Because what happens is, when people do not have a vision, by default, they perish. Their life uh, collapses. They fail. And you know why they failed? They didn't fail because they didn't have the gifts, the talents, and the ability. They failed because they didn't have a vision. And that's something you want to impart to your husband or your spouse, your children, or to yourself. Even if you're a single person, you have to, person, you have to minister to yourself and implant that. So that's the foundational concept that I want to layer in today into your lives is that the need to have a vision from God, and I'm not talking about a mystical vision, I'm talking about a vision of what you're supposed to become and what you're supposed to do and where you're going. Now, I will tell you in my own personal life, I had a tremendous difficulty for, for decades in my life 
trying to find God's vision and purpose and direction for my life. I, ha- I-, I want to confess to you that, that, wow, I mean, it was a struggle for me. I did not have a clear vision for my life for most of my life. You know that? I didn't. I didn't have a clear vision for most of my life. I had little bits and pieces of visions, but not they didn't form a co- coherent picture. And I was praying to God like crazy. I was seeking the face of the Lord like crazy for wisdom, for guidance, for vision. Now, the Lord gave me a generalized vision. It's not like he didn't give me any vision at all. He gave me, let's call them dots again, but he wasn't connecting the dots. And those dots were things like that. This, I'll share with you what my vision was. It wasn't really clear, but you can only work with what you have, and that's the best that I had. The vision I had for my life was that I was to be in ministry of some kind, and most likely it would be in an unorthodox and unusual ministry that didn't fit most of the traditional stereotypes of ministry. And then the Lord impressed in my mind and heart that he wanted to use me to speak, and that was a gift, to communicate, and that was a gift, to write books, and that was a gift, and that the Lord wanted me to uh, um, pastor people in a non-Orthodox way and fully utilize the media. So I had dreams in my heart of producing feature films, hosting my own radio show, writing books, and in some of my earlier notebooks that my wife and I have reviewed, uh, I prayed to the Lord and asked him, to make it possible for me to write and speak full time. And I'm telling you, that has been a reality in my life for years now, but it was brought about by miracles of God. And yes, I was very diligent. Now I'm telling you this to encourage you because you may feel discouraged. You don't know what your vision is uh, and, and you feel guilty. And you, you, you think, well, based on what I said to you that you're going to perish, you're going to crash and burn, you're going to go down because you don't have that clear vision. And after all, Paul, you just said, if you don't have vision, the people perish. And, you you know, um, you mistakenly have picked up the idea that, that I'm inferring that your life is going to crash and burn and it's going to perish because you don't have a clear vision. And that's not what I'm saying. Now, then you may say, well, you're saying... What you're saying is contradictory. No, I think what I'm saying is honest. You know, the Lord meets each one of us where we're at. So we seek the Lord. We ask him for his vision and his plan for our lives. Our job is to keep seeking the Lord, keep studying his word, keep uh, allowing him to uh, show us what our lives and what our purpose is to be. And then we release it. We don't go on autopilot, but we release it and we trust the Lord, but we continue to pray. And I want to emphasize this other spiritual principle, which is one of the most powerful principles in the Bible that I know, and that is the principle of never giving up, tenaciousness, tenacity, and keeping at it, keeping at it, keeping at it. In other words, you're, and because God is blessed by that. God is blessed by your motives. So if you don't have that clear vision from the Lord, you don't have to fear perishing. As long as you are doing the best you can at the level where God has you, You don't have to fear perishing or fear that you're failing God if you don't have a clear vision for your life. As long as you're doing your part by faith to seek the Lord diligently, asking God for him to reveal his vision for your life. God will honor that. And even though you haven't yet acquired a clear vision, He's honoring what you're doing in terms of 
baby steps and his grace is upon you and his blessing and favor will be upon you because you are attempting to get the knowledge of God. You're attempting to seek God for him to give you his vision. So you're not going to perish because you've purposed in your heart to move in the direction of seeking and gaining wisdom. And the Lord will bless you for that. I hope you understand that. It's very powerful and very important. Now, for some people, getting this vision is far easier than others. For me, it was like climbing Mount Everest, okay? It was like I went through such discouragement and such, because the reason is my call by God, my talents and abilities are very unorthodox. They don't fit into a box, okay? You know, it, it's a lot easier for many guys that I know you know, they went into the ministry, they pastored local churches, uh, and, you know, that was it. I mean, not that that was it, but that's, they bloomed there. Some men went into the, and women went into the business world, and they made, they have had good careers, and the Lord has used them in their careers, and God has blessed them. But God clearly showed them a vision of pursuing a particular kind of business and a career. So for a lot of people, it's a lot simpler because they they find the Lord reveals to them where they belong, where their talents and abilities are, and they plug right into it, and everything they do comes out of that place. It's not so complicated. For me, it was like incredibly complicated because I didn't have any role models that I could look at, or if I did have role models, it would have been like one or two on planet Earth. Okay. And so it was very frustrating. Now, but I didn't give up. I continued to seek the Lord. And then I want to share another principle that I believe will set you free. But where I'm leading in this uh, edition of the Paul McGuire Report, where I'm leading is that how to acquire the vision, how to use God's power to release the vision, and then pursuing the vision with faith, with faith and, and aggressiveness so that you occupy the land of your vision, both collectively and personally. Because when you understand these principles, they will set you free because the truth shall set you free. And it will enable you to hit the target that God has for you. And that's where you're going to find peace and fulfillment and not have frustration. So I believe this program will be of tremendous encouragement to a lot of you. And I definitely believe that this is the kind of program that you want to send to people you know. Send it to them creatively through social media. Tell them what's in, in the message of the Paul McGuire Report. So they, have, so they have a reason for listening to it. Because, you know. The vast majority of people are looking for vision and wisdom for their lives, and they don't want to be frustrated. So I believe this will help you in a big way. Also, you can go to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. And take advantage of all the book discounts we have. Uh, tons of free new videos. Roku channel is growing. Uh, you can look through all the archives of the Paul McGuire Report. Hear them yourself or send them to people. Uh, we're, we have regular updates on what's happening with the ministry of Trumpocalypse and uh, other ministry things we're doing. We have updates, reports, success stories uh, due to you, by the way. And again, as we're into the new year, I want to personally thank you from Every part of my heart and being, I want to personally thank every one of you who chose to be obedient to the Holy Spirit, who chose to seek the Lord, and when God called you to be a prayer warrior and partner of this ministry by regularly uh, interceding for me, my family, and this ministry, I want to thank you personally for being a faithful prayer warrior. I can't tell you how many times I know that I know that I know that your prayers made the difference between destruction, literally death, 
and spiritual victory. You have no idea because I can't talk about all these things publicly. So thank you. And I want to thank all of you who, who took my uh, exhortation to, to use your creativity and abilities to promote these programs and circulate them far and wide because many of you are very creative with the usage of social media and with your help, because we don't have a professional team of people doing this, your willingness to use your talents to get these programs into the hands of all kinds of people is a blessing. So I want to thank you for that. And for those of you who both prayed and chose to sought the Lord about how you could help us finance these uh, social media, television, and film and radio and other outreaches so we could reach millions and more millions and more millions and millions of more people for Jesus Christ. I want to thank each one of you who went to the Lord without any preconceived ideas and simply asked the Lord, what can I do? How can I help? How can I partner with Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church? And then you simply stepped out of faith and whatever God told you to do, you obeyed him and you made, you've continued to make your donations and contributions. I want to personally thank you for that because that's, that's the reason why we're able to make progress, the prayers and the, and the contributions. And I want to thank those of you, and you know who you are, and don't think I don't appreciate and I don't remember. I do remember, I do appreciate. Uh, a number of you sought the Lord, like, Lord, what can I do? And I challenge you to think outside of the box and be open to what the Lord said. You know, don't have some preconceived idea. And a whole bunch of you did that. You know who you are. And you made contributions in some unusual ways. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to name the ways because the, for, for various reasons, but, uh, <laughs> You just did things, and you know who you are, that were just quite, I knew it was from the Lord, because you were you contributed and donated in out-of-the-box ways that have really helped us, and I appreciate it. So I, I don't want to let this program slip by without really thanking all of you. And I need your partnership um, and your prayers and support as we move as we continue to move into 2018 because 2018 is going to be an incredible spiritual battle the battle for america is going to heat up and god has called us for such a time as this he knew us before the foundation of the world so having said that in a moment we're going to pick up and i want to share some principles Powerful principles that I didn't understand. Other men taught them to me. But they unlocked my destiny. They gave me vision when I was struggling to find vision. And I want to say overall, don't allow your fear, your anxiety, your insecurity, or a lack of self-worth or poor self-image or whatever it is, or lack of training, don't allow any of that to define who you are or to determine your destiny. Because with God, all things are possible. And God is not bound by these human parameters. So take heart. The Lord is able to do way above, way beyond anything you could ask or think in the name of Jesus Christ. We'll be back in a moment. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. I'm Paul McGuire. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. And we're talking about the biblical principle that we need, you and I need, the, the vision of God in order um, to be victorious and to accomplish what God is called to accomplish. That's why God says in his word, without vision, my people perish in their personal lives or collectively. So I want to go back in time. Uh, many, many years ago, I guess this would be 1979, 1978, approximately. And um, um, I was in Salt Lake City with my wife. Months before I was in Manhattan, New York City, 
uh, running a big part of the Lambs Club ministry. Now, uh, my wife is not a Mormon, by the way. Uh, and I'm not a Mormon. But for me, going to Salt Lake City was like going to Little House on the Prairie. I didn't know what to expect. But I knew, well, I'll just tell you, man, I'll just tell you. It's kind of a short way to tell you. Um, I sought the Lord before I got married. My wife sought the Lord. At the time we were dating, um, I was experiencing more success in my life than I'd ever experienced in my entire life. Because when I turned my life over to Jesus, he raised me up in a powerful ministry at a very fast rate, uh, you know, that, that blew my mind. I was producing Christian telethons. I was producing and promote, promoting very large contemporary Christian music concerts on Broadway and Times Square at the Lambs Club. I was hosting the Christian concerts. I was the youth minister, so I was youth. I was ministering from the platform. Uh, leading people to Jesus Christ, and we would. And I was responsible for producing all the acts, and we would fly in people like the second chapter of Acts, Barry McGuire, uh, Noel Paul Stuckey, oh, and so many love song and many big artists of that time. Okay, and it was it's called the Lamb Supper Club, and it was in the New York Times, and it was covered by network television, and thousands of people were coming to this large. Uh, it was an old actors club building that was restored, but it had a full Broadway theater in it, as well as a full ballroom for dining and all kinds of things. So we literally, through volunteers, would serve people a four-course meal. You may think that's indulgent. No, it wasn't indulgent uh, because we we offered it at a very low prices. So that Christians all over New Jersey and New York City and upper New York could come into the city and enjoy a night out and be ministered to in kind of a festive occasion. And and then they hear Christian musical acts, which would cause the people they bring to uh, receive the Lord as their Savior. So many people uh, came to the Lord through that. Uh, and also... Um, um, there was one point I, wa I wanted to bring up about this. Um, we did very unorthodox, out-of-the-box things. So, for example, people would, the volunteers would dress up, uh, you know, with like tuxe tuxedos, bow ties, gowns, and stuff. Uh, one lady was a professional, professional cook in big restaurants an African-American lady, and she was just a gem, and she would cook these wondrous four-course meals and do the food ordering and stuff. And it was a ministry. And so um, we would even, on different days, to demonstrate love to the homeless and to the down and out living on the streets of Manhattan, etc. They could come to the Lambs Club now think about this for a moment. Uh, uh, we would help them get cleaned up because this this was a massive complex. It had showers and all kinds of things in the basement and it had like four levels of basements. And uh, I know because I went down to the fourth level basement, which was like a subterranean chamber on my hands and knees with a bunch of other people cleaning out the old publications with Laurel and Hardy and all kinds of stuff. You know, it wasn't a particularly uh, sanitary place, but it did that. So anyway, we would invite the homeless, uh, the poor, the needy people were hungry, and they knew, you know, when we would do this. And we would literally wait on them and serve them four and five course meals in an elegant ballroom where they would have a menu and the waiters and waitresses would be wearing gowns and tuxedos and we would treat them as if they were the elite and the super wealthy. We would treat them with that level of caring and kindness. They would get the full benefits of a very classy, uh, what the media would call a born again nightclub on Times Square. And guess what happened? 
there, there would be tears in their eyes. They would be sobbing. They would be coming to Christ. And you know why? Because they would share with us that, that they had never been loved like this in their entire life, that they had never been treated with such dignity before. You see, by treating them not just as human beings, but by treating them as if they were, you know, billionaires uh, and, and an elegant four-course meal, and it was a very elegant place, but it was all kept running by volunteers, which was very, very difficult. Uh, then they'd hear gospel music and they'd hear ministry and they would come to Christ. And one particular gentleman, man, this guy was such a saint. He, he uh, began to accumulate clothing for them, clean, fresh, new clothing, showers. And we would distribute clothing and food for them in a big way. So this was not some self-centered, you know, type of thing. So... This whole thing was exploding with television programs and everything else. In addition, behind the scenes, I had met with a famous British movie producer who produced the movie called Jesus, which Campus Crusade distributed all around the world. And it's, I think of like over a billion people have watched the movie Jesus and have come to Christ through the movie Jesus. Well, Talking about you know the Lord giving you the, the, that leading, that the, that that prompting from the Holy Spirit, I had read about this in People magazine or whatever, and the Lord spoke to me by prompting me, by stirring me up in the Holy Spirit that I needed to make an appointment with this big time uh, British producer John Heyman, and I met with him at his private office, and he told told me all about the Jesus movie and stuff. Now, at that time, uh, at least to my knowledge, he was not involved with Campus Crusade for Christ. Later on, I had volunteered to work with Bill Bright, even though I was never, a quote, a member of Campus Crusade for Christ. So at the time I met this British producer, um, as far as I know, he had no uh, relationship with Campus Crusade. Campus Crusade for Christ and Bill Bright. So in order to um, um, do what the Lord put in my heart, and this was a weird thing because he had a very sophisticated film company back then that they were leasing a movie that was all about Jesus. The, 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 the words were just the Bible. Yet you'd see the people in his office, and this was, remember, this is in the 70s. People were like kind of crazy back then. The girls were, were not wearing bras and tight outfits, and the guys were, you know, they were very hip, like filmmaking people, yet they were releasing this film on the gospel. And uh, so I gave, I outlined a plan for him in paper, and I spent many hours telling him how, because the Lord put it in my mind, how to, distribute this film globally, work with churches, and use it as an evangelistic tool to reach millions. And he was on fire with my idea um, because he was just going to release it in a plain theatrical release, and I made a theatrical release that was an actual ministry and typed up for him like a 45-page uh, master plan to reach the nation and the world with his with his movie. Okay, so at that time, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ wasn't involved, as far as I know. So um, I had married my wife, who was a Christian actress. She, I met her in a Christian play I was producing on Times Square, and uh, we fell in love. It was very romantic. Um, walking around Central Park, we determined, both of us, that we would remain sexually pure before our marriage and that we would not have any relations of any kind before we got married. Now, um, you know, in my life before Christ, without getting into specifics, you know, I was like a party person and everything else, but I wanted to do this right, and I wanted both of us to do it right. So we had to be blunt. We had no sex before marriage. And I sought the Lord in fasting and prayer before I made my choice for a wife. 
He goes, above everything, she, my wife was very beautiful, very attractive, an actress, but, bef but above everything, I wanted God's choice for my life. So I used the no mind of your own principle. So no matter how much I wanted to marry her, unless the Lord spoke to my heart through fasting and prayer and gave me the green light, I would walk away from that relationship. And it's interesting how the devil works, because the devil sent some women at the same time, and guys and ladies, you don't have to use a whole lot of imagination to figure out. You know, all of a sudden, these women very seductively appear out of nowhere, and I'm trying to think, well, who should I marry? But I didn't have a piece about these other women. The only person I had a piece about was with my wife, Chris, and I knew the Lord wanted to get us married. But she was a Christian actress. Uh, she, she won a scholarship to Juilliard, etc., the famous acting school. So shortly we, after we were married, we fought like cats and dogs. And I'm being polite. Cats and dogs, it would be more appropriate to say the early days of our marriage was like the Vietnam War. Because we both came from dysfunctional households, okay? And like it or not, you're a product of the programming of your environment. So ni neither of us were ever modeled a healthy marriage. In addition to that, she uh, kind of had a crisis because she came to Broadway. She came, she wanted to be into, in the entertainment industry to be an actress in virtuous they could be secular, but godly, virtuous, positive entertainment. Okay, now I'm not saying everything she wanted to do was like Mary Poppins, but, but you know, the, the innocence and the virtue and uh, the purity of so many secular films back then and secular plays is totally different. She, she was not there to do nudity and vulgarity and immorality. And yet that's all that was being offered to her, and she was having to turn it down. So she couldn't take it anymore. And she, she had to leave because of the stress, you know. And she went back to Salt Lake City where she was raised. But um, I wasn't angry, but she left, okay. Well, yeah, I was angry, I and mean, the Lord had to deal with that. But she left, and I was, like, devastated. And I'll tell you why I was devastated. I was devastated because, and I want this to minister to you, I was devastated because I did everything I possibly could to do the marriage the Lord's way. You know what I'm saying? Um, we didn't have sex before marriage. I prayed and fasted. I, I did not get married until I knew the Lord said, this is the woman. And so I said, since I did everything in the Lord's way, I was expecting God to bless me and honor my efforts, not have my wife leave me and go back to Salt Lake City. So that was a huge trial in our marriage. I'm surprised we're still together. In fact, I read some Christian uh, psychological thing in some big Christian magazine, and it was a psychological test by real born-again Christians that were developed. And the test, if you answered the test questions, it would give you the percentage rates as to whether or not, as a Christian, your marriage would last or end in divorce. So as I filled out this uh, psychological profile test developed by Christians, the results were that our marriage was guaranteed to fail and it had like a 5% likelihood of success and a 95% likelihood of divorce. And that's pretty scary, okay, what the experts are saying. Well, thank God I didn't listen to the experts. Thank God I didn't listen to the experts. I, I literally picked up my cross to follow Jesus. I left all the success that I was experiencing for the first time in my life. I walked away from it all. I flew back to Salt Lake City in terror because to me, Salt Lake City was like Marie and Donny Osmond. I thought there were covered wagons and people had these Amish hats because I mixed up the Amish 
um, you know, in Pennsylvania with, with the Mormons, and they're nothing like each other. And, and when, <laughs> when I landed in the airport and the jet was landing in Salt Lake City Airport, I could see the gigantic Mormon temple, and I'm saying, what have I gotten myself into? But you see, I, I pursued my marriage because the Lord told me, and this is a tough thing, man, to leave everything and pursue your wife, pick up the cross and follow Jesus, which I did. But that was my income. That was my success. So I only had like $400 in my pocket um, after the airfare, and I landed in Salt Lake City. And let me tell you what happened. Uh, what happened was the Lord honored my willingness to leave everything and pursue my marriage. And my wife was delighted to see me, and there was great healing in her life because uh, her father, who didn't ever sexually abuse her, but emotionally abused her, you know, messed her up in terms of her trust of men. And when she saw me, and she knew that I had left everything to pursue our marriage, it caused tremendous healing in her heart. And guess what happened? What happened was the first night... And this is going to be kind of real. So you can choose to have young children listen or not. There will be nothing of a offensive nature whatsoever. This will be something that I personally think a third grader could hear because the content is not going to refer to anything that uh, would be inappropriate. Okay. But, you know, I'm trying to glorify God, okay? And at the same time, respect your uh, commitment to raise your children uh, in, in a holy manner. So what I'm about to say, I believe, will bless a lot of people, and it will not be in any way, shape, or form uh, offensive. So the way I'm going to say it is very will be very dignified. So let me put it this way. We experienced like a second honeymoon, like four months after we originally got married. And all I can say to you is the blessing of the Lord upon our reunion, and I'm talking about in the emotional, physical, romantic, psychological sense, in every area, the Lord poured out his blessing in his glory. And it was, you know, I'm opening up kind of a private place of my life, but I feel like I need to do it because I believe there'll be healing and encouragement coming out of that for people. So um, we had we had a communion. We, we came back together again. And the Holy Spirit was very present. And then when we woke up in the morning, uh, the sunlight filtered through the window. And we both woke up in bed, and the glory of God filled the room. And it was obvious, and it was the most poetic. It was the most amazing, most pure, most romantic thing that I've ever experienced in my life. It was like the anointing of the Lord and the glory of the Lord was poured out upon us because we were willing, no matter how imperfectly, to, to pick up our cross and follow Jesus in order to keep our marriage together. And God blessed that. Now, you know, all I can say is I've been around the block, okay? I never experienced anything like that in my life. But God was revealing himself and saying, you know, you are doing what I consider important, and that's why I'm blessing you. And then the other thing that happened, now this all ties into the vision uh, you have and the purpose you have for your life. The other thing that happened is that in the human sense, I left I left the only real success I had ever experienced in a profound way in both the media industry, the television industry, the film industry, 
and in ministry. I mean, it was a happening place. It was known nationally, and it was creating a, an East Coast Jesus movement explosion, okay? And so for me to walk away from the only success I ever experienced was de devastated, but I, I obeyed the Lord. So the Lord planted in my heart, beginning in, in college and high school, and when I was a young guy, and then when I got saved, he always put it in my heart to have a media ministry, to be a filmmaker that would use film to reach people for Jesus Christ, and to be a minister and, and a writer. That's what the Lord put in my heart. But that's somewhat unorthodox. And those of you in the entertainment industry know what I mean. But, but my vision for my future, my vision for my ministry was not that clear. It was kind of fuzzy because I didn't have anybody to model myself after. And I will say this, when you're, and this is why I'm very concerned about young people and that young people have role models they can relate to and people who are like heroes for them, male and female, that they want to be like in a godly sense, okay? It's just this is the way human personality works. So while I was in New York, I happened to read, pick up a copy of People magazine. And there was this huge story about a guy named Hal Lindsey. Uh, and this was all about the success, in, you know, the Bible prophecy teacher, and all about the success of his Bible prophecy book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And this guy looked cool and hip and intelligent, and he didn't look like a geek or a religious nut. And I said, I, I could see myself doing something like that. And there were his kids and his wife, and it just looked, you know, something like something I could relate to. Now, tragically, uh, Hal Lindsey ended up divorcing his wife and children. He still is a father committed to his children. But that happened years later. And just because he missed the mark later on, uh, regarding more than one marriage, um, that's problematic for a Christian leader. But I've heard the other side of the story from people who know him closely, so I'm not so quick to pronounce a judgment on him. I'm not justifying anything, but I'm not so quick to pronounce a judgment on him because I've heard the inside stories regarding these things. So, so the Lord used that and introduced me a love for Bible prophecy, and I knew that Bible prophecy would be an important part of my ministry. So what I'm trying to tell you is my vision of what the Lord was calling me to do with my life became much, much clearer. And what caused it to become much, much clearer was my act of obedience of leaving all my media success and film television success by leaving it all in the dust, uh, going into the middle of nowhere with $400 in my pocket, with no hope of anything but Jesus. That act of obedience supernaturally released my vision. And I'm trying to share that with you is because many of you sometimes want to see the supernatural vision for the, uh, of the Lord for your lives or the supernatural guidance of the Lord for your lives and you don't know what's blocking it, and sometimes you have to pick up your cross if God's calling you to do that and radically obey him. And when you do that, all of a sudden God supernaturally releases the vision and the guidance and the favor that you've been trying to get the whole time. So radical obedience to the Lord is a key to unlocking your vision and purpose. So... Um, the weird thing was, when we arrived in Salt Lake City, I had no idea this was the case about Salt Lake City. I, the only thing I had in Salt Lake City, our marriage was being healed. We were getting along great. We found a tremendous church. Um, I began speaking. And let me tell you about speaking. I would share my testimony at Christian, Christian businessmen meetings for years in Salt Lake City. There would be anywhere from seven to 12 guys or women max. And we would have kind of a private room in very humble 
you know, salad bar type restaurants. And, and God would move whenever I would speak in a powerful way. But I didn't demand an honorarium. Uh, what they would give me for speaking was they would pay for my salad bar lunch, which was a very modest lunch. And I did this for years, okay? And I want you to know that that too is a key in releasing God's supernatural vision for your ministry or anything he calls you to do. Because I, because I was being tested by the Lord and I was willing to minister in total obscurity and, and pour my heart out in ministry and speak to men and be used by the Lord where nobody was looking to, to audiences of seven to 12 people for free, just a salad bar lunch. But I was faithful with that for years, okay? I want you to know that. That's why I talk about my ministry didn't come out of nowhere. And guess what happened? Because I was faithful to the Lord. I don't want you to think this is like all about me. This is supposed to be something I'm sharing that will set you free. But because I was faithful to minister to the Lord in total obscurity and for no material gain, the Lord raised me up supernaturally. I'm talking about supernaturally. And the next thing I know, three years later, four years later, uh, my face is on the cover of their international magazine, which prints a million copies. I'm being invited to speak at their largest conventions um, with some of the biggest names in, in Christian ministry. Um, you know, to to audiences of like 35 40,000 people and all of that happened because I was willing to speak for nothing in obscurity so faithfulness to the lord is another way god gives you that vision and gives you favor and the anointing okay the other thing that happened that I didn't know was salt lake city just happened to be now god knew this uh, the international film capital for independent feature films, both in production and distribution. It was the worldwide center for independent feature films. Because out of Salt Lake City, you had movies like Noah's Ark, The Adams, not The Adams Family, Gri Grizzly Adams, um, um, Christian docudramas, nature and wilderness uh, films, uh, and then films like I was involved, Wind Walker with the Native Americans, uh, um, the, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of family films, the late great planet Earth, Hal Lindsey's film was produced by these companies. And I, um, uh, became trained as a somebody who could market, distribute, produce, and put films together, feature films together, okay, by simply obeying the Lord and following my wife to the middle of nowhere. And so um, they, did, they did a thing called four-walling back then, which was a revolutionary means of releasing films that the uh, producer would rent theaters uh, and then we would do a release. And these were pretty big campaigns. I mean, we would open in hundreds of theaters and stuff. And some of these became the all-time best-selling movies in Hollywood. Now, so I was trained in doing that, and then the Lord miraculously... Now, just picture this. There I am in Salt Lake City with, like, not a penny in my wallet. I need a job. My wife has a job. Um... So I put on a suit. It's the same suit I got married in because I deliberately chose a, a classy, nice suit, not a tuxedo to get married in. So after the marriage was over, to, to be prudent, I could use it in the business world. And somebody gave me the gift of a very nice attache case. And uh, my hair was a little bit longer than the average Mormons, but I had my attache case, my three-piece suit, uh, my white shirt, my tie, 
and I would go to these giant office buildings near the temple in Salt Lake City, pray, constantly pray, pray, walking there, pray, constantly claiming the promises of God, constantly speaking the promises of God, as I walked by faith, not by sight, but I claimed the miracle of provision. I claimed the miracle of favor and open doors. I called out for God to supernaturally guide me and to make a way where there was no way. Now remember at this time I had no clue of any film industry in Salt Lake City. So I go to these giant office buildings and I look at on the directories of hundreds of businesses and I notice there's the name of a film company there in Salt Lake City. So I go up to that floor by elevator with my suit, my attache case. The guy's from Hollywood. He just happens to be here. And he is uh, um, he's putting together a distribution company for, for a Hollywood feature film. And because I could write press releases, he hired me as the PR man and then the promotional man and then gave me a, a, a pretty nice position in marketing distribu and distributing these feature films. So I rode that, and then I, I went back out in my suit, and I prayed to the Lord, and I, I claimed by faith, resources, open doors. I was in, I'm talking about I was in constant prayer. And then um, um, this Christian minister came to town, who I knew who he was, and they had a home meeting. And I had, uh, by faith, I found another film company in the same giant building. And uh, I came into there and handed them my resume and was applying for a PR uh, public relations position for the film that they were raising money for and were planning to produce and distribute. And I was applying as a PR man. So nothing happened. It kind of got stuck. I felt the Lord was leading me to contact them, but it kind of got stuck, okay? So, um, I met, we gathered with other Christians, this, this visiting Christian businessman who had a powerful ministry at somebody's house. He led us in a time of communion. I took communion with my wife, and then he, he encouraged everybody in the room to pray to God regarding the miracles they needed in their lives. And, um, you know, in my heart, I knew this film company deal was stuck. Now, you know, you can dismiss this as whatever you want, but I can't because God worked on behalf of it. So, you, you know, some people say, well, that's name and claimant theology. Well, whatever you want to call it, it was, it was based on scripture, and when I prayed this prayer, a miracle occurred. Now, I'd never been a subscriber to the, all the teachings in the faith movement, okay? You know that. I've talked to you about that a lot. But there were some original principles in the faith movement that were accurate. The problem is later on it got out of balance. But this prayer I prayed that night was biblically accurate. We took communion, and then we basically spoke to the mountain and the obstacle between me and this film deal, we commanded the obstacle obstacle to be removed and cast into the sea, and we claimed that this film door would open. Now you can scoff at that, see, but the next morning, the head of the film company mysteriously calls me. I go down there. I'd been waiting for months, and right after this supernatural prayer, um, he offers me a job as the PR man for his film company. But then the favor of God, as I continued to pray, came upon me, and I became the head of distribution and marketing, and then I became the executive producer on the film and basically became one of the, the, the key players in the distrib distribution and production of this feature film. And this was a miracle. It was faith and calling on God that gave me favor. Because remember, I'm a, I was a non-Mormon. So that caused us to move to Hollywood. And uh, who, there I was getting into the center of the major motion picture business in Hollywood. But I got there 
by taking the exact opposite direction, the exact opposite route. Uh, when I left Salt Lake, uh, when I left New York City to pursue my wife and restore our marriage in Salt Lake City, from a pragmatic standpoint, I literally left New York City and traveled 180 degrees in the wrong direction. From a human standpoint, this was suicidal. It was the worst thing you could do for your career. But because I put my life in God's hands and was willing to pick up my cross and follow Jesus, he took this adversity, totally turned it around, and it was from this place in the middle of nowhere called Salt Lake City that I rose up in the feature film business. And then my next move is I went to Hollywood, and there was another series of miracles, which I won't get into, uh, which involved a meeting in Manhattan, New York, um, with two uh, people you would probably know. And uh, he presented an idea to me. Again, I applied for the PR man position. God gave me supernatural favor. And uh, I began being one of the co uh, uh, partners of this company. And I became executive producer on a major feature, major independent feature film. And so there was other feature films distribution after that. The point is, God raised me up to, to a limited degree in the independent feature film industry in Hollywood. My wife was being granted starring roles. But this all came about, it had nothing to do with earthly wisdom. Because I was doing everything that should have been the opposite of what I should have done to make it in the film business. And it all centered around obeying the Lord and prioritizing my marriage. You see, because I was willing to do that, God took elements that should never have worked in a million years, put them together supernaturally, and used them as the very ingredients to bless me and clarify the vision of being a feature filmmaker. Now, there's a whole lot more to the feature filmmaker story and television shows and everything else. But I just wanted to share that with you to show you how obeying God in areas that he's calling you to obey him in and doing the opposite of what the world teaches you to do and picking up your cross to follow Jesus. If you stay connected with Jesus and you stay connected with his word, God will release his miracle power, I'm dead serious, to make a way where there is no way. And I want to put that into your hearts and minds for 2018. As you face struggles, difficulties, challenges, frustrations, as you struggle with a lack of vision regarding your life, how am I going to make it? How am I going to do it? You know me in my teaching, and I very much stress being diligent, being educated, being trained, etc., etc. But above all that, when the Lord speaks to you, and you know it's the Lord, and you have to do something that people in the world, or maybe your Christian friends, are saying, hey, that's crazy, you shouldn't do that. I had Christians tell me, well, meaning, you know, this, this, this girl you married, she's no good. She left you, and you just better, you know, have a divorce and, and end it. That's what most people told me. They thought I was crazy. I thought I was crazy, but I fasted and prayed, and I didn't make a move till the Lord spoke to my heart. He literally told me, give up everything. And that was hard, because that was the only anything I ever had. Give up everything. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus. I moved across the country to what I thought was going to be like, like, you know, Donnie and Marie Osmond and the Amish people. The next thing I know, I'm being raised up and in, 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 in globally the most powerful center of independent feature filmmaking. So he clarified my vision. Now, there were, tri there were trials there in Salt Lake City. There was spiritual warfare. It wasn't easy, but God gave me the victory. So I want to transfer those lessons into your mind and heart. I want to uh, share with you the supernatural encouragement that comes from obeying the Lord so that the Lord can lift you up and restore your vision. So as you look at your 2018, 
and that of your loved ones, that of your family, that of uh, your life, the challenges you face, the dreams you have, the vision you need, the calling you believe God has for you, the struggles, and you feel like you're facing incredible obstacles, and in your intellectual mind, you just don't see how you're going to overcome these incredible obstacles. I want to, as your brother in Christ, Paul McGuire, introduce the element of a biblically-based supernatural power that is released when you obey God, when you follow his direction, when you cry out to him for wisdom and step out on faith. Now, what that means, when you face 2018 and you're renewing your mind, you're not being naive, you're being prudent, you're counting the cost, you're being intelligent, you're using the training God has given you, but I want you to look into your 2018, and every one of us have challenges and difficulties and adversities, but I want you to spend time asking God to, to sharpen and clarify the vision he has for you. I want to encourage you to ask God what he has for you, what his call for you is, what he wants to do in your life in this year. It could be heal relationships. It could be delivering a son or a daughter. Could be any number of things. Seek the face of God. Spend however long that takes. Fast, pray, renew your mind. Seek the face of the Lord. And then the Lord, at that time of his choosing, will begin to speak to you through that uh, still small inner voice, through deep impressions, through other people. But the bottom line is, you will know that you know that you know that it's the Lord speaking to you, not your imagination. And then do whatever God has told you to do. And you're not going to be presumptuous because you've prayed, paid the price to listen to him. Now, what that means, as you're looking at 2018, look at 2018 as a promised land. We reviewed this the other day. Look at 2018 as a promised land, like the land of Canaan that Joshua and Caleb uh, came to. And then there were other of the Israelites uh, that were called to spy out the promised land. Now compare this and contrast this to, to 2018 being your promised land. Every time God gives you a promised land, you're going to have spiritual enemies, you're going to have spiritual battles. If you're not up for that, then Stay home, suck your thumb, play it safe, and allow nothing to happen in your life. Because God will give you the supernatural ability to conquer your enemies and your adversaries. So, the land was filled with milk and honey. It was a possession. It was an inheritance for Joshua and Caleb and the children of Israel. So, God sent out the first group of spies to gather intelligence in the land and spy and size up the situation and give a report back to God. These people, and we need to make sure we're not these people, these people were walking in an unbelief. We do not want to be people that walk in unbelief. And in their unbelief, they saw giants in the land. They didn't see the power of God operating in them in the land. They noticed the land was filled with milk and honey and all kinds of treasures. And they said to God, they gave God an evil report and said, we can't take the land because the giants are greater than us and they will devour us. That response of unbelief and a, and a bad report, evil report, uh, that, that God did not use them. In a sense, he cursed them. He, he refused to allow them in the land. That is the mindset, by the way, that a greater percentage of Christians have. You have to be on the alert for your adversary, uh, like a roaring lion seeks him whom he may devour. The, the statistical majority of Christians are walking in the mindset of unbelief. They're offering up to the Lord an evil report. You don't want to be like them because God cursed them and they never got the land. 
you have to you have to guard yourself and to and to protect your thinking, protect what you hear, protect what you read, protect what kind of radio programs you listen to, what kind of television programs you listen to. You have to guard your heart and mind because you can't allow yourself to be contaminated by that unbelief and evil report because it will bring you down. And that's where most of Christianity is today. That's why the nation's in the mess that it's in. On the opposite side of the fence is Joshua and Caleb. They uh, obey the Lord. They spy out the land. But they have a totally different mindset, a faith-based mindset. And they see those giants, and they see all the wonderful promises in the promised land. But they perceive the giants through faith like grasshoppers. And as they're perceiving the giants like faith as grasshoppers, supernaturally, the perception of the giants is changed, and they begin to see themselves as grasshoppers and Joshua and Caleb and his men as giants. See? Game changer. Faith is a game changer. So Joshua and Caleb offer up to the Lord a good report based on faith in God's word. And they say, Lord, we are. Uh, there are giants in the land. But we see the giants like grasshoppers, and they see us like giants. And then they said, Lord, we are well able to take the land. And so they did. They invaded the land. They destroyed the giants. And they gathered all the rewards of conquering the promised land. God has a promised land for you. God has a promised land for believers in this nation. God is not a respecter of persons. So the same dynamic spiritual laws that he has used throughout history are applicable today. So I want you to look at 2018 regarding your children, your grandchildren, uh, your life, your marriage, your singleness, whatever the struggles you're facing, whatever the challenges and difficulties you're facing, whatever the adversities you're facing. Think of, think of 2018 as your promised land and think of all the adversities and trials and challenges that are coming against you, trying to prevent you from, from getting the blessings of the promised land. Think of those enemies, adversaries, adversities. Think of them like the giants, like Joshua and Caleb. But don't stay there. Allow the Lord to renew your mind and change your perception. So now, if you will do that, if you cooperate with the Lord, he'll change your perception, and you'll look at all those challenges and difficulties and, op and opposition uh, in the land in 2018. You will now look at it through the eyes of faith, and you will not see them as giants anymore. You will see them as grasshoppers, small beings that can be conquered. They will not prevent you from realizing your destiny. So you train your mind through the power of the Holy Spirit and renewing your mind with the Word of God to see these problems as grasshoppers. And then you own it. You own that perception. And then you have to take the next step that's very important. In faith, by renewing your mind with the Word of God, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you begin to perceive yourself as a giant and your challenges as grasshoppers. So it's on that foundational, revolutionary, miraculous transformation of perception that you are then able to receive the supernatural anointing of the Holy Spirit. And now you can go into the promised land and you can conquer the grasshoppers and you can possess the promised land. You can give the Lord a good report and say, we are well able to take the land. And you look at 2018 and there's going to be a fight spiritually, but you are going to be victorious. You are going to take the assets, the resources. You're going to defeat the blockages and the opposition. You are going to eat 
and, and acquire the milk and honey of the land. You are going to accomplish what God has put in your heart to accomplish. And 2018, if you're synced up with the Lord in the right way, 2018 is going to be a positive game changer for you and your family. You should shout hallelujah, man. And you call upon God and you rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. And you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, which says with God, all things are possible. Now, that's a game changer. And many powerful things will happen because of it. Now, simultaneously, your life, the life of your children, the life of the people you know, your grandchildren, other Christians you know, all of those lives are in juxtaposition in the spiritual realm with the lives of millions of Christians in America and around the world. The same principles we learned uh, a few minutes ago are now transferable to the great spiritual battle for America, for turning the tide of the spiritual battle of America, and for getting the supernatural power and wisdom to occupy the land as, of America, as Jesus Christ said, which means to drive out the spiritual enemies trying to pull down America, destroy our president, and destroy our nation. Those beings which are energizing the human beings are being energized by demonic powers, principalities and powers. The Apostle Paul says, for our not fight is not against flesh and blood. It's against the principalities, the powers, the dark unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. So the supernatural powers which are energizing the deep state, energizing the constant assaults on Donald Trump, energizing the mainstream media attacking Trump constantly and lying, energizing the tech giants, the principalities and powers energizing the globalist occult elite. These are all enemies. Now, you're going to be tempted when you look at this. Most Christians won't look at it. They'll be in denial about it. But you're going to be tempted for a moment when you look at all these players on, on the most important spiritual battlefield of all time. Okay? You're going to be tempted to to retreat in your mind and do what that first group of spies did, which is to tell the Lord an evil report, you know, and say, there's giants in the land and there's nothing we can do. So we're just going to retreat and escape. That's what the overwhelming majority of Christians do. But you've learned these powerful spiritual lessons in the area of your person, personal life, just like David did. David was able to enter the central spiritual battlefield and confront Goliath, the Nephilim giant, and take him down because David, in obscurity, was a shepherd boy and he was slaying um, lions and uh, um, wolves and other creatures that were attempting to devour sheep, which represent God's people. So the supernatural training that David received was applicable to the battle between the children of Israel and Goliath. So David had that, David did not offer to the Lord an evil report. The Heavily trained troops of Israel, including King Saul, they were the equivalent of uh, special ops. They were the best warriors anywhere. They had the proper armor. They were highly trained. But they were so caught up in fear as they saw this giant that they were paralyzed by fear. So in a sense, they offered up a, to the Lord an evil report and said, we can't do anything. We're going to be defeated. We're just going to hide. And behind Goliath was the massive Philistine army waiting to pulverize and destroy and eat up the armies of uh, God's children being led by uh, uh, King Saul. 
So David offers up a good report to, to the Lord and to King Saul and to his brothers who are highly trained soldiers and to the armies of Israel. David walked into their camp and he noticed they were petrified with fear. They were in paralysis. So King Saul, you know, is desperate. His brothers mock him and notice that his brothers mock him through accusation because Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So God uses a religious spirit operating among God's people to attack David and accuse him of uh, trying to, you know, gain a name for himself or whatever by doing this, which is not what David was doing. The reality was the reason they were accusing him and were being motivated by a religious spirit, which happens to you and I when we step out in faith, by the way, is that David was offering up a good report because he truly believed God. And his brothers and the armies of Israel were offering up a bad report. King Saul was so terrified and burnt out that he was willing to let David uh, go in there because, you know, he was desperate. So he offers him his impressive armor of the flesh. David declines the armor of the flesh, which represents that David declined humanistic, logical, human power and wisdom in favor of the supernatural power of God. So David goes on to this important spiritual battlefield with a slingshot. And David whirls his slingshot and hits the Nephilim giant Goliath in the head, who crashes dead with a thundering reverberation on the battlefield. And then all the Philistine army is watching David, because Goliath is their champion. And not in some militant Islamic way, but in a way that was the custom of that time, David chopped the head off the, uh, the giant Goliath and he held the head up to show all the armies of the Philistines and the armies of Israel living proof that Goliath was killed. And that meant the Philistines didn't have this giant to, to cause them to have victory. And that also meant that once that giant was killed, the armies of Israel could gain boldness once again and gain the confidence to conquer the land and drive out the Philistine armies. So the Philistine armies fled in terror, and the armies of Israel pursued them and slayed, and slayed them. The net result was the children of Israel occupied the land. They took the land, despite the giants that were in the land. What does this mean for you and I, collectively as the body of Christ? Right now, in America, we are, unless you're in a place of deep spiritual denial, we are in the greatest battle in all of human history. That's exactly right. And if you want to understand that, because that isn't just words, then you need to read my books, Mass Awakening, A Prophecy of the Future of America, Conquering the Matrix, and get yourself a copy of um, Trumpocalypse. And the book, A Prophecy of the Future of America, 2016-2017, is a completely no book, but even though it ends in 2017, it contains all these powerful principles for financial victory, for wisdom, that will enable you to take the land in 2018. Now, you seek the Lord. You recognize that because God called you before the foundation of the world to be here for such a time as this, that God has given you an assignment from him command from him regarding the larger spiritual battle, which is so powerful here in the U.S., because if the U.S. falls, the world will go into deep spiritual darkness. What happens in America is very important because we're the last nation alive which has a legal structure, which has an economy, and which has Christians with vision and passion who can 
uh, set up America to be the center of a last day soul harvest. America can be used as a platform to win people to Jesus Christ from all around the world. But in order for that to happen, we must win the spiritual battle before us. And there's an all-out confrontation going on right now. It's all out. It's not partisan because members of both parties are on the side of the occult globalists who are attempting to rebuild what God forbid in the garden and in, in the uh, mystery Babylon Genesis 11, which is a one world government, one world religion, and one world economic system. President Trump, we need to understand this. President Trump is under all out attack. They have committed to removing him from office by discrediting him, by calling him mentally unstable, uh, by um, uh, drumming up some manufactured crisis and making him the fall guy, by lying. And I believe that they're so serious about their plans to remove him from office that they would not hesitate to kill President Trump. Those are sober words. But we have to take ownership of those possibilities. So we need to understand that we were called before the beginning of time to be here for such a time as this. And God is in the process of forming supernatural vision in the hearts and minds of his people so that they can achieve the vision and the instructions that God is giving his people. It is not the will of God for America to crash and burn at this particular time. And so all true Bible-believing Christians that are in an active supernatural relationship with the living God. I'm not talking about religious people. I'm talking about people who are in an active supernatural relationship with the living God and are calling upon his name and are seeking his face and are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, allowing their minds to be renewed by the word of God. The Lord is speaking to you and he's forming your vision. And when I say these words to you, you share in your spirit the burden that I have in my spirit regarding the danger that the president and our nation is in because what this election has revealed to us and brought out in the open in very, very uh, brutal ways, anybody with half a brain can look at what's happening and understand that there is an invisible government ruling our so-called elected government both in America and around the world. This invisible government is controlled by what is called the deep state, which are the international occultic globalists that have enormous power in attempting to seize control of this world. Many people in the deep state work for the international globalists. They don't work for America. And they're in the middle of a massive power grab that the Bible predicted they want to install their new world order without God, their one world government, their one world religion, and their one world economic system for a number of reasons. First of all, it's what God warned about in Bible prophecy, starting in Genesis 11, repeated throughout scriptures, and then reintroduced in the book of Revelation as Mystery Babylon. In Genesis 11, we see the world's first occultic one world government, one world religion, one world economic system. God comes down to the Tower of Babel and ancient Babylon. He sees that they want to be like gods, that they're serving Lucifer, and he sees the evilness of their one world government because they want to be like gods and they are serving Lucifer. So God judges the people of Babylon. He confuses their language. He disperses them to all the nations of the earth. And why does he do this? Because God is clearly saying that God is against a globalist one world government. And God is saying that he wants 
independent sovereign nation states to function freely because they operate as checks and balances against a global government which is produced by fallen human nature and has the capacity for perpetuating enormous evil. You have to grasp that. That's true. Number two is God shows us in Genesis 11 that he is clearly anti-globalism. God shows us in Genesis, Genesis chapter 11 that he is uh, totally committed to nationalism. He's totally committed to patriotism and the independent nation state. Why? It's very simple. God knows that fallen man is sinful in nature and that if fallen man is able to organize the world into a one world religion, one world economy, and one world um, uh, global government, that this will be Luciferian in nature and great unspeakable evil will come from it. Now, that is correct because when we study the book of Revelation and we heed the warnings in Genesis 11, we see that this, this totally satanic government of pure evil is going to emerge during the tribulation period when the Antichrist is revealed. And Satan himself will indwell the Antichrist, who has set himself up in the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem, and he's demanding the populations of planet Earth to worship him as God. And then the false prophet, who is known as the second beast, the false prophet is totally in charge of the one world religion and the one world economic system. And you cannot buy or sell unless you receive a microchip or a nanochip or uh, uh, some kind of sophisticated technological chip implant in which you cannot buy or sell and participate in the global economic system unless you renounce Jesus Christ as Lord and pledge to worship the Antichrist as God out loud. You see how this works? Consolidation of power is based on renouncing Christ and worshiping the Antichrist. So, the, the most horrific and the most evil government in the history of the world, will rise with the coming of the Antichrist, which should happen at the very beginning of the seven-year tribulation period. All the people on planet Earth, we will go into a global totalitarian state. And every person on planet Earth will be totally controlled, body, soul, and spirit, by the microchip implant, the mark of the beast. In order to receive that mark of the beast, you must renounce Jesus as Lord. And you must openly worship the Antichrist as God. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. It is important that we rightly divide the Word of God. We cannot afford the luxury of interpreting Bible prophecy falsely. Okay? We got to get in gear. Jesus Christ said, Occupy until I come. That means we are to occupy the land that God has given us. For us in America, it is America. If you're in another nation, it's another nation. What Jesus meant by occupation is we must spiritually, by using spiritual weapons, drive out the powers of darkness that are attempting to control our nation and our government and our people. We must drive them out, and we must maintain authority and dominion that Christ has given us over America so that God's vision for America can be fully released. God wants to see a biblical revival, a biblical third great awakening. He wants to see demonic evil purged from our nation, and he wants to see America released to be a shining light on the hill for all the nations that are succumbing to darkness. We are supposed to be the center of a global soul harvest. We're supposed to be the center of evangelism. We're supposed to be the center of 
discipleship around the nations. This is why our president, moving under the Spirit of God, recognized Jerusalem. So this is how it's going to play down. This is how it's going to go down. And you must get in synchronization with the Lord. Because if you don't, you're going to end up committing a serious sin. What is sin? It comes from the word metanoia, which is, refers to like an arrow. And when you don't sin, the arrow hits the bullseye perfectly. You hit the target perfectly. But if you're, you're off and you shoot the arrow and you miss the, the target or you, you go four or five inches from the center of the bullseye, that's called metanoia. You've missed the target. Now, the only way God's people can miss the target is to not listen to him and not rightly divide his word. So let's get this very clear. We don't have the luxury of bad Bible teaching. Right now, we're in the time period where these opportunities exist, especially the opportunity to occupy until I come and change the, the spiritual dynamic of our nation and to preach the gospel, okay? But in order to fulfill that, we must allow the Holy Spirit of God to touch the eyes of you and me and the church in America and anoint our eyes with eye salve supernaturally, which is how Christ ministered to the uh, church of Laodicea, which was neither hot nor cold, but they were lukewarm. So God said he's going to puke them out of their mouth, but he still loved them. And he says that you need to have your spiritual vision restored so you can see my vision. And how is the spiritual vision restored? God anoints believers like you and me with the eye salve of the Holy Spirit so that we can see once again. And what does God want us to see? He wants us to see clearly his vision, his vision for you and your destiny, his vision for the destiny of America in the last days in this interim period before the Antichrist emerges, we are to take dominion spiritually and uh, release revival, a last day's soul harvest, and discipleship around the world. That is our calling. And if we obey our calling, God will protect our nation supernaturally from totalitarianism. God will prosper our economy God will take the enemies of the gospel and he will subdue them and you will see miracle after miracle come upon our nation. Trump is an act of grace. You need to get the book Trumpocalypse. It is deep. It is powerful. Um, Dr. Ben Carson read it in two days. He devoured it. We're going to send up a picture of him talking about it with Dr. Kevin Jessup. He says it's turned his life around. And Vice President Pence will receive a copy personally, and so will President Trump. Pray, though, like Carson, that Trump, that, that, that Trump's handlers will not try to block him from receiving the book. Because our inside contact, who loves the Lord, said that if Trump sees the cover of Trump Apocalypse, he'll grab it and he'll read it. And the Lord will minister to him in a powerful way. There's people inside that inner circle that would like to make that book disappear. We need your prayers. We need your prayers. Now, with your vision restored, you have to understand that 2018 is a spiritual battle. The armies that hate God are mobilizing. They will do anything to bring the Trump, to bring Donald Trump down. Okay? That's how serious it is. Impeachment, assassination, you name it. There's a battle with deep occultic forces and a deep state. We are not powerless. We have been given the supernatural power of God, but we need to use it. So I'm asking that you would cry out to God, that you would seek the face of the Lord, that you would ask God to anoint you with power from on high and set your heart on fire like it's never been set on fire in your entire life. So you would be a living example of a man or woman who experienced revival. And then ask the Lord to, to heal your eyes so you can see a vision for what you're supposed to do. If we partner together, if we partner together, this 
small ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church, along with the projects that we're involved in. And I'm not claiming to be the only ministry that is doing the Lord's will. There are other fine ministers and ministries that are doing the Lord's will. And you need to be discerning and support and partner with those ministries that are doing the will of the Lord, whether it's my ministry or somebody else's. God does not need a numerical majority to win the spiritual battle. So, a dedicated minority, a dedicated remnant calling on the power of God can change the direction of America. Our goal should be nothing less than changing the direction of the spiritual battle in America and turning the tide and toppling the spiritual forces of darkness in this nation that are illegally trying to exert their authority. But the only reason they can illegally attempt to exert their authority is because God's people are not, by faith, taking God at his word and exerting the supernatural authority of Jesus Christ, which says that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, and when we pray in Jesus' name, that overrules any authority on heaven and earth, because the name of Jesus is above every name on heaven and earth. We are at the precipice right now in the spiritual realm. We're at the precipice of igniting a full-blown, powerful, biblical revival that will rock this nation. And if we call out to God in unity, true Christian unity, and we agree, and we call out to God, God will answer our prayer. And as we call out to God in partnership, he will shatter the strongholds in the invisible realm. And this verse will be true, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, which means the fortified demonic cities of Satan, in this nation where he's holding people in captivity and he has these gates and prisons to lock them in. The battering ram of the church of Jesus Christ will smash down the gates of hell and we will set the captives free by the millions. I need your help to do this. We can do it. We have feature films going. We're ready to influence the president, but I need you to seek God with all your heart, soul, and mind, ask him how you can donate and contribute. Seek the Lord and become a prayer warrior and pray for us like there's no tomorrow for me, my family, and this ministry. You have no idea the intensity of the spiritual battle that has already started to happen. But we are going to take the land. Do you understand that? We are coming together as one and telling the Lord we are well able to take the land. We are going to move in this time period of history before the return of the Lord, and we are going to turn the tide of the spiritual battle by relying totally on Jesus Christ. This is what the Lord wants. So we need to launch forward and aggressively take back what the devil has stolen. God has a plan for America, and it is our job to Make sure that God's plan for America and your personal life is released. Nothing is impossible with God. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. Visit paulmcguire.us and spread this message far and wide with your creativity. Spread it far and wide and allow the fires of revival to, to burn in other people's lives. We are going to see things that you never believed you would see in 2018. It'll be a great spiritual battle, but you're going to see victories that you never thought were possible. God is moving. This time of lethargy is over, my friends. It's over. Let's take the land. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire.